So the, um, there was a trial that was published about uh, 2017. It was called a TCOS trial that looked at, uh, and it was, it was a modern trial where patients that were enrolled were on statin therapy, they were on good antihypertensive uh, therapy. And so when you looked at the causes of death in that trial, so about 15,000 people were uh, enrolled and about a thousand deaths uh, were documented over the course of that trial. And if you look at what killed people, about 50% of the documented deaths were due to cardiovascular disease. So as we follow patients, a primary um, concern for us is consideration of avoiding heart disease. Or, and so that's one of the major reasons I wanted to talk about how do we think about assessing risk factors and reducing risk factors, not just glycemic control for our patients with type 2 diabetes. On, so on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see that 49% had cardiovascular death. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that often it was sudden death, myocardial infarction, and heart failure. And about 40% of the time was presumed to be due to heart failure. So this is the reason why we're, we're talking about what we're, we're talking about today. Okay. So I wanted to present a case that most of us probably see fairly frequently. So the patient is a 34-year-old. Uh, she's um, a Latino who comes to see you really for some other reason. She has a history of hypothyroidism. And during the course of the visit, she says, you know, I have a family history of type 2 diabetes and requests a hemoglobin A1C. She's asymptomatic, but she also has a history of gestational diabetes. So you get an A1C and it comes back at 8.3. On physical exam, she has an elevated BMI of 37. She has evidence of insulin resistance with the presence of acanthosis nigrocans. The rest of the physical exam is normal. So you get started with teaching her how to use a glucometer. You start her up on metformin. And so now you start to counsel her about improved diet. So the next set of slides are going to be about dietary counseling. Now, please keep in mind, these questions are not about diet for blood sugar control. The questions are about what would you counsel about diet for reducing the risk of heart disease? Okay, so here's the question. So we're trying um, audience response systems here. So if you would, you can um, look at the top of the screen. You can either go to a, a website and respond um, to, at pollev.com slash Deepika Reddy, and you can see that, or you can text um, your answer. So would you tell this patient to avoid simple carbs, avoid trans fat, suggest starting a keto diet, or suggest intake of vegetables, legumes, or fish in an effort to improve the risk of cardiovascular disease. And so I'm gonna go ahead and set a timer for about a minute. So Dr. Reddy, real quick before you do that, I'm, I'm seeing that the, the website is a little small on my screen. So I'm gonna put it here in the, uh, in the chat feature. Everybody can see that come up. So you go on your, on your computer or your cell phone to pollev.com slash app. Is, is that accurate, Dr. Reddy? pollev.com slash, and then it would be Deepika Reddy, 634. That would be on the website. Well, ev.com slash Deepika Ready 634. Correct. Okay. All right. Okay. Or where they can text. Or you do Deepika Ready 634 and you text that to 22333 once to join and then you put in the, the uh, letters. Okay, so they can send a text message. The text should say, be pick a... Ready. Get this right. Be pick a... It's always fun trying to type in this people watching. It's 634. And text that too. 
2233. And then they simply choose A, B, C, or D? Correct. Okay. Okay. So I'll give us a second to get on. Okay. Tell me when you want me to start the. Yep. Yeah, go right ahead. Actually, maybe I'll have you do it, Jared, because I'm. Yeah. Would you mind running the timer for me? Yeah, just run a. Give, give it 60 seconds. Yes, please. Got it. Starting now. Okay, and if you let me know when we're ready, I can say show responses. Thirty seconds. Ten seconds. Okay, that's one minute. Hey, okay, fantastic. So Fabulous, um, and and that is the the answer is uh, D, and we'll get to uh, in a little bit uh, more detailed discussion of that. But I I wanted to let you know the exact guideline that I'm going to discuss. So in in the fall of 2019, the AHA uh, put out a set of guidelines on primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Now, this wasn't specifically for patients with type 2 diabetes, but it, it pertains to patients with type 2 diabetes as well. And very briefly, I want to go over how they code the uh, recommendations. So on the left-hand side, they color code their guidelines and their recommendations. So if the the recommendation has a strong um, a level of uh, recommendation. It's it's coded green. If there's you know moderate amount of uh, confidence in their recommendation, it's yellow or orange. Or if there's strong harm related to a particular recommendation, then it's coded red. And then there's also color coding for the level of evidence. Uh, in the literature for a particular recommendation. And it's, I bring this up because we, when we have guidelines, um, I think it's important uh, to have a sense for, are these guidelines based on just expert opinion or is there really strong data to back it up? So as we go along in this talk, I am going to point out not just what the guidelines say, but the degree of data or evidence or strength of um, the data to support it. So coming to the dietary stuff. So if you look at um, the guidance on vegetables and legumes and nuts, it's strong recommendation and there's actually um, good randomized control trial to show there's a reduction in cardiovascular disease um, with the, the use of these um, this type of a dietary change. There's some data, if you reduce saturated fat um, and increase monounsaturated or polysaturated uh, fats, there might be some improvement. If you reduce cholesterol and sodium, there might be some improvement. If you reduce processed meat, there might be some improvement. Now here's, so of the choices, I said simple carbohydrates, as we know, the ADA has suggested the use of less than 100 grams of carbohydrates per day, but that's for glycemic control. There's no data for cardiovascular outcomes, so um, you guys didn't choose that, so that's, that's excellent. Uh, 
The second was a keto diet, and there's no data on cardiovascular outcomes with a keto diet, so excellent that nobody chose that. The trans fats, there's actually some data of harm if you completely avoid trans fats. And so that's what I wanted to point out uh, to you as well. Now, the, I do want to point out the study that uh, was published in 2000, initially in 2013, on the use of um, olive oil and nuts that showed improvement in cardiovascular outcomes. It was called the PREDIMED trial. It was done in Spain in 2013. And what they did was they had people in three arms. One was the regular Spanish diet, and the other two arms was the so-called so Mediterranean diet supplemented with either olive oil or nuts. And the interesting thing about this is when it was first published in 2013, there was a tremendous um, uh, findings of 30% reduction in cardiovascular outcomes. And there was actually some skepticism because this data didn't reflect some of the epidemiologic data that was available at the time. And so people went back and looked at this data more carefully. And so in 2018, they actually retracted the original data because the patients actually were not randomized into these arms as was originally mentioned. But what was fascinating is they reanalyzed the data as if people were not randomized. So, and they republished the same information in 2018. And interestingly, the data showed the same advantage of 30% reduction in cardiovascular outcomes, which is fascinating. So here's the data. This is from 2018 reanalyzed data. So let's look at the y-axis. This is the risk of cardio, cumulative risk of cardiovascular disease. And the outcome, of course, is either a history of heart attack, stroke, or death from cardiovascular causes. The black line is those that were just on the controlled diet. And uh, the red line is those that were on Mediterranean diet, diet and nuts. The green line is Mediterranean diet and extra virgin olive oil. And as you can see, fairly soon, there's a separation in the risk of these events. And in both of them, there is a significant reduction in hazard ratio of about 30% reduction in these events. And if you went out beyond five years, you get the sense that that separation is actually widening. So if you go out 10 years, um, th there might even be a significant you know, widening of that um, risk reduction. So this is where the guidance comes from for the use of nuts and, and you know, Mediterranean diet, basically. Okay, so I wanted to show you one other study and, and, and the reason I want to show you this is even though it's frustrating to keep talking to patients about the need for dietary change, there is a real good reason to do so. This study was published in 2017, and it comes from the Nurses' Health Trial and the Professionals' Follow-Up Study, and it looks at many thousands of people. And basically, Patients who were enrolled filled out dietary questionnaires, and they did them at some regular intervals. And based on how good their diet was, they're, they're given scores. And there were three different scores that were looked at. So this particular slide was on this index called the Alternate Healthy Eating Index. And so in this index, the higher the score, the better the person's eating habits were. So what this um, shows you that is they looked at the baseline score, so people could have had low, medium, or high scores, and then they looked at the score at 12 years. So in each of those groups, if the starting score was low, but they ended up either at low, medium, or high, in those that improved their dietary score, there is a substantial improvement in death from any cause. And the only thing that changed 
is that they ate better. And this is true no matter which group they started in. If over the 12 years they improved their diet, the risk of death improved. So here's a reason, even though it's frustrating, to keep at it with the nutrition counseling. Here's another way to look at it. Again, it, this comes from the same, I'm sorry, I didn't put a reference here, but this comes from that same paper that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, if this, on the y-axis, it's the hazard ratio of death from any cause. And this is three different dietary scores. This is the one you already saw with the, with the alternate healthy eating index. There was another one called the alternate uh, Mediterranean diet score and the DASH score. And basically, if there was a 20 percentile increase in the score over a 16 year period of time, there is a substantial reduction in the hazard ratio of death. And this is a, a visually nice, you know, look at what can happen if people just eat better. So I think I've beaten that one to death. So let Dr. Me... Reddy, I'll just interject here really quick. Yeah. Um, number one, I noticed that Naomi, we do have a dietitian on board. Okay. Um, so that's wonderful. And number two, I'm just jumping with joy that you're talking about the nutrition, my background being a dietitian originally before a nurse. Uh -huh. And one of the things that, and I don't know if you're going to talk about this, but it's often the barriers that physicians or providers find in, you can talk, there's the talk of the nutrition changing and improving diet, but getting back in there of what really the barriers are and utilizing your staff and dietitians and things can be a really helpful long-term journey to try and identify those barriers. Yeah. I, I agree. I think using the team that's available um, and also, um, and, and, and to some degree also, um, looking at where the individual is and, and, and not trying to get to some ideal diet, right. but pivoting to some degree, because all of these are just a increase in the score. It's not saying that all of these people are reaching some ideal. They're just saying, they improved from where they were. And that's a, a, a pretty good uh, goal to have, is just to have each individual get better than they were. And that's also a, a, you know, a nice goal to have. Thank you. That, yeah. Okay. So now you, you, you talk to her about the physical, uh, I mean, about the, the nutrition. And now you start to talk to her about physical activity. And she works in retail, mostly um, her job is as a cashier, but sometimes she stocks shelves. She gets no other formal exercise. And you tell her she needs to start at least 150 minutes of moderate physical activity a week. And she'd like to do more, but she wants to know what constitutes moderate physical activity. So our next question will be, Which of the following do you think constitutes moderate physical activity? A, and I know this is really nitpicky, but um, I do think it's important for us to talk about uh, the details of what constitutes, um, you know, light, moderate, and, and vigorous activity. So do you think walking at a rate of two miles an hour is moderate? Biking at 10 miles an hour is moderate? Recreational swimming is moderate? Or light housework is moderate? Okay, so Jared, if you don't mind setting the timer, please. Thirty seconds. <laughs> 
10 seconds. And time. Okay, this is actually quite quite nice when there's a, a spread, so it, it uh, helps us have a conversation. Um, so the answer actually is recreational uh, swimming. A walking two miles is actually not considered; it's considered light, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, biking is considered at ten miles per hour is considered vigorous, and lighthouse work, of course, is considered um, light and not vigorous at all. So this slide comes from that uh, guidelines. If you look at how uh, US adults spend their day in terms of physical activity, we do not spend a lot of time um, being physically active. As you can see, uh, at least eight hours are spent sleeping. Sedentary activity is defined as expending less than 1.8 five METs. So we spend nearly eight hours a day expending less than 1.5 METs. And then we spend about eight hours in light METs, which I believe is defined as like three METs or less. And we spend about 12 minutes a day in moderate to vigorous activity. So I'm going to let you let that sink in for a minute. Um, and most of you know what the guidelines are, which is we should encourage people to be uh, in optimally physical active, uh, to have an, a physically active lifestyle. We know that we should encourage people to have at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensive aerobic physical activity to reduce atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. There's good evidence for both of that. If the patients can't do that, then we suggest being engaged in as much as they can. Um, now let's define what each of these types of activity is. So sedentary behavior is one to 1.5 METs, and these are the types of activities that um, would be sedentary behavior. Light behavior is 1.6 to 3, and this is the sort of activity that constitutes light behavior. So moderate activity is walking between 2.4 and 4 miles per hour, biking between 5 and 9 miles per hour, ballroom dancing, yoga, recreational swimming would constitute moderate. And so this is important to know because when we counsel patients about physical activity, being more specific about what that actually means helps our patients because patients will say to me you know i i walk i'm actually quite active i take my dog for a walk but how fast are they walking how far are they walking is that really raising their heart rate and i think quantifying some of that and having them even if they start at light activity increasing it up to moderate becomes important. And so I'm going to make the case that we start to quantify physical activity a little, a little bit more consistently uh, with our patients. And then of course, the reason why the biking uh, was not moderate because it was equal or more than uh, 10 miles per hour becomes vigorous uh, activity. One of the things I want to uh, point out is standing, even though it's, less than 1.5 METs is not considered sedentary behavior, which is why you see a lot of people having standing desks. Um, and so if, if you have patients uh, who have jobs where they're seated a lot, you might want to consider um, talking to them about having standing desks. Whether that improves their glycemic control or changes their cardiovascular outcomes, I can't say but it technically does not um, fall into sedentary behavior. Another study that was published in the Journal of American Heart Association, um, it looked at a meta-analysis of 36 studies. And this is very useful to tell patients. If a patient increases their physical activity METs 
by a little over 11 mets per week. And this is not in patients with diabetes. This is in, in all comers, non-diabetics. But raising the mets by 11 per week reduced cardiovascular events by 23% and the incidence of type 2 diabetes by 26%. But this is the kind of data that can be really helpful when you're trying to encourage people to increase their physical activity. So increased activity has a clear relationship to outcomes. And this is the motivation to try and have people um, not, not run marathons, but to go from where they're at and have some increase in their weekly activity. Okay, if there are no questions, I'll, I'll move on. Okay, so after three months, she, she's doing her bit in terms of lifestyle change. She's on the metformin. You uh, titrated the dose to a max of two grams per day. She comes back for follow-up and her blood sugars are still a little bit high. Her A1C is better, but it's still above goal at 7.3. She has normal renal function. She's not pregnant. She actually has pretty good insurance. And she's wondering what her next, what the next step is. What are her options at this point? And so which of the following medications would you start her on? Now, please note, there isn't one perfect answer. Um, but if you were seeing this patient, which of the following would you choose? What do you think, Jared? Can I share responses? Yeah, go ahead now. Okay. Again, very, the, there's a spread. So nice to have a, a, a conversation. So let's, let's move on. Uh, but half of you would have chosen an SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, some portion would have chosen a GLP-1 and, and some would chose a sulfonylurea, okay? So I'm sorry that this is a very, um, uh, the, the lettering is kind of small on this, but this is a flow sheet that comes from the um, guidelines, the, the AHA guidelines. Uh, it, so in patients with diabetes, the recommendation, if you notice the A1C is over six and a half, is dietary counseling, exercise, start with metformin. If the A1C is less than seven, then reinforce diet. If the A1C is not, then does the patient have other cardiovascular risks? And if so, consider either an SGLT2 or a GLP-1 agonist, um, and uh, if not, then you could use uh, other agents. And I think the vast majority of us are already uh, doing that. So the question I have for you, this lady does not have pre-existing cardiovascular disease. Is there data that 
in primary prevention, do we have data that the GLP-1 agonist um, reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease? We know there's data in secondary prevention, but do we have data with primary prevention? Thirty seconds. Ten seconds. Time. So uh, there is some data. Um, and, and I'll, I'll show you the, the study. The, there was a study called the Rewind Trial uh, published in Lancet last year on the use of dilaglutide, in, which is trulicity, um, in cardiovascular outcomes. Now, this study enrolled people that either had a, a known history of cardiovascular disease or patients over the age of 50 who had at least one risk factor for heart disease. The difference between this trial and other trials with GLP-1 agonists is that 70% of the patients in this trial did not have a pre-existing history of heart disease. So again, it wasn't all of them, but 70% did not have a known history of heart disease. And this is the closest we're gonna to get to primary prevention data. And in this study, uh, if you look at panel A, this is the composite cardiovascular outcomes. So, and that includes cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI or stroke. It barely makes the confidence interval. So if it crosses one, so it was 0.79 to 0.99. If it crosses one, it's not significant, right? So there was, it, it it's just 0.99, it barely makes that, that, that criteria. There was a reduction in the hazard ratio of about 12% in this combined cardiovascular outcome with the use of 1.5 milligrams per week of trulicity. And if you look at each of the components that make up this composite, cardiovascular disease was not significant, Myocardial infarction rates, not significant. It was the stroke rates that was important. So, trulicity appeared to improve cardiovascular outcomes by improving non-fatal stroke rates. And of the people that were in that study, 70% did not have a pre-existing history of cardiovascular outcomes. So one could assume that there is some primary prevention data with the use of dilaglutide or trulicity. Um, what about SGLT2 inhibitors? Um, and I, you don't necessarily have to answer this question because I, I, there, the, I'm just gonna go ahead and talk about this. The problem with a lot of the studies is they don't have just patients without a history of cardiovascular disease. There's not a lot, uh, there is no study that has looked at the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with risk factors, but no cardiovascular disease. The best study we have is the use of dapagliflozin in one of the, the TIMI trials and um, they, about 40% of the patients with the use of dipagliflozin 
did not have cardiovascular disease. In that study, there was a reduction in a combination of cardiovascular death and heart failure, but really it was the heart failure risk reduction that really drove that outcome. And so that's why if you look at all of the guidelines, if there's a patient who has a risk of heart disease or risk of heart failure, then an SGLT2 inhibitor is definitely um, something that one can use. So going back to all of your answers, could you choose a SGLT2 inhibitor? Sure, it's not an unreasonable choice. The A1C reduction that you want, um, SGLT2 inhibitors will reduce your A1C by 0.5 to 0.8%. Um, you won't have weight gain with it. And so it's, it's a very reasonable choice. The patient does not have a known history of cardiovascular disease. Uh, so you don't have to push for the GLP-1. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, weight and weight change and, and why a GLP-1 might have been a reasonable choice as well uh, in the next couple of slides. So could the BMI have driven your decision? So most of you uh, are probably well aware of the SCALE trial, which looked at the use of GLP-1 agonists for weight change. So of all of the agents that we have for diabetes management, the, the ones that are most effective for weight loss are the GLP-1 agonists, of which semaglutide or ozempic is going to be the most effective where you, you get on average about four kilogram, four to five kilogram weight loss. All of the rest are slightly less. SGLT2 inhibitors give you anywhere from one to three kilogram weight loss. So I'm only going to show you data from the SCALE trial. The top panel gives you percentage of weight loss. The bottom panel gives you absolute weight loss in kilograms. So this trial was actually not just in diabetics, it was in all comers. But if you look at liraglutide or Victoza at 1.8 milligrams, both 1.8 milligrams and three milligrams give you a significant reduction in body weight. As long as the patient stays on these agents, it's a persistent weight loss. And you're getting about, you know, six kilograms, with the three milligram uh, dose of uh, liraglutide. So could you make the case for using a GLP-1 agonist in this particular individual uh, so that you can get a greater weight loss? Not something to think about. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the ADA guideline on choice of medications for type two uh, diabetics. I know it's a busy slide, but the top of the, the, the guideline is what's the first line therapy when you first diagnose a patient, lifestyle change, and metformin. The reason metformin is chosen is there's an older study, uh, the UK PDS trial uh, from the 1990s, that showed if patients are overweight and were started on metformin, there was a, there was a reduction in myocardial infarction rates in patients who were placed on metformin. It's also been around forever. We know there's not a lot of uh, side effects. It's inexpensive. And so most of us do start patients on metformin for that reason. After that, um, they, they, the, there's a division by presence or absence of cardiovascular disease. If the patient has either established or high risk for cardiovascular disease, the recommendation is, oops, sorry. If the patient has primarily atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, then the decision points are going either with a GLP-1 agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor that has known cardiovascular benefit, which frankly is, you know, empagliflozin, DAPA, or CANA all have shown cardiovascular benefits. If, however, the patient has 
predominance of heart failure uh, or renal disease, then you would preferentially go with an SGLT2 inhibitor. So SGLT2 inhibitors reduce blood volume by about 7%. And they do that within the first 12 weeks of being started on GLP-1 agonists. That reduces blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure can go down by three millimeters of uh, mercury. And a lot of the cardiovascular advantages that you see with SGLT2 inhibitors in a lot of these trials is from reduction in heart failure and admissions from heart failure. And so if you have a patient with type 2 diabetes who has a tendency to, towards heart failure, and even in obese patients with right-sided heart failure, then the use of an SGLT2 inhibitor is really not a bad choice. So those of you that chose empagliflozin, I could see why, you know, just being obese, if you're trying to get some degree of weight loss, especially if, if you're worried about the potential for right-sided failure, uh, not a bad choice. Um, and the other piece is uh, CKD. If the patient um, has a history of CKD or has a reduced GFR, the patient has been on uh, ACE inhibitors and despite that has increase in urinary protein, the addition of SGLT2 inhibitors is, um, is a good idea because there has been now numerous trials that have shown the loss of renal function is stabilized in patients that have been placed on um, SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, this is true of empagliflozin, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and although you might see a transient drop in GFR, um, th there is persistence, uh, th the continued drop of GFR is stabilized in patients that get put on uh, SGLT2 uh, inhibitors. Okay, now what if the patient does not have established uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? The next consideration, I would argue, is making sure that we're not doing anything to cause weight gain, or if possible, try and achieve weight loss. So again, most of us are probably turning towards either GLP-1 agonists or SGLT2 inhibitors as our second line treatment if the patient can afford it because of the efficacy in terms of weight stabilization. Um, the, like we talked about, like I said already, uh, GLP-1s probably have a better effect on weight, but SGLT2 inhibitors are also not bad. Uh, if you start with the GLP-1, if the A1C is still above goal, you can try an SGLT2 or vice versa. The big problem with these is cost. So uh, whoever chose uh, sulfonylurea, um, it's most of the time, those are the choices if um, cost is an issue and the insurance will not cover uh, these agents. The other issue to keep in mind is in young women of childbearing years, you have to remember that um, these agents are not necessarily uh, approved for use in pregnancy. So we have to remember to warn young women about this to make sure that they're, they're using contraception, that these GLP-1 agonists or SGLD2s are not necessarily indicated uh, in pregnancy. And so uh, just to be aware of that and make sure we're counseling our patients about that. Um, the problems with SGLT2 inhibitors is you have mild weight gain, you have a greater risk of hypoglycemia, um, but they do control blood sugars. And if patients can't afford it, uh, those are a second line choice. And then of course, the other large uh, consideration is if the patient is elderly, is at increased risk of hypoglycemia, especially if they have bad renal function, uh, thinking about agents that minimize the risk of hypoglycemia, and those would be the DPP-4 inhibitors, which I didn't give you as a choice, but in this patient, you know, her A1C is 7.3 after she's on metformin. A DPP-4 DPP inhibitor would not have been a bad choice, um, 
and with metformin, the, any of these agents, DPP4 inhibitors, GLP-1, SGLT2, or even a TZD, does not cause hypoglycemia. These are decent choices if you're worried that somebody has elderly with a history of cardiovascular disease um, and you don't want to cause low blood sugars, these would be a first choice. So I know I spent a lot of time on this uh, slide, but I think um, these are important considerations. And I, 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 uh, I think um, going forward, this is only going to get more complex, uh, but this flow sheet uh, tends to make it a little bit easier to think about. Dr. Reddy, I do have a question really quick. Yes, of course. Um, and this, of course, is a, there are barriers with this, with costs and et cetera, but I'm thinking of patients who come in who've had sustained weight uh, gain or obesity or, or severe, significant obesity. Mm -hmm. um, what is, how, are you seeing patients who are going the bariatric surgery route? And at what point, how do you handle those questions that come in from people that say, oh, I've tried that, I've tried that, I've tried that. And at what point do you say, well, maybe we seriously will look at a bariatric consideration? Absolutely. Um, you're right. I didn't, I didn't put that into the conversation. I think bariatric surgery should be considered fairly quickly in a patient with uh, type 2 diabetes. So the recommendations in non-diabetics, I guess, is if you have a BMI over 20, in patients with type 2 diabetes, if you have a BMI over 35 and they've tried lifestyle change and you've tried a GLP-1 agonist, now, there isn't a specific time frame, but I'd say if, you, if patients have tried for at least six months and they haven't had substantial weight change, um, it's a very reasonable thing uh, to suggest, and I will bring it up with all of my patients. And the reason the, 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 the metabolic surgery should be considered and should be considered fairly quickly is because, and as a, as a medical person, it actually kills me to say this, but the surgeons do... Uh, offer something that, that we really can't, which is uh, slightly more sustained weight loss. Because if patients come off of the GLP-1 agonist, within about six to eight weeks, the weight comes back on. And with metabolic surgery, patients keep at least 30%, even if they regain weight. Most of them maintain at least... Um, 30% of the weight loss. That, so they go down to a nadir and then they keep off at least 30% of the weight. There's also the added benefit, there's reduced blood pressure, there is reduced risk of malignancies in patients who've had a bariatric surgery. So there's a Swedish obesity study that has now followed people for 20 years after bariatric surgery and there's some really good uh, data. So thank you for asking that question. I think we should be offering it early. I think we should offer it um, in most of our patients with type two who have a BMI over 35, who despite um, lifestyle change and GLP-1 for six months or so, who, who really are struggling with weight. And, and, and it should be offered and the patient should make a decision about whether they want to pursue that or not. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I guess in this case, I decided to put the patient on dilaglutide um, for the added weight loss advantage and uh, titrated to 1.5 milligrams per week. She tolerates it pretty well. And then you review the potential complications from diabetes and you obtain uh, a little bit more of a history. And other than uh, hypothyroidism type 2 diabetes, um, she has a, a family history of type 2 diabetes and a dad. Uh, cardiovascular disease at the age of 65, mother has hypertension. Actually, I'm going to stop for a minute here. I, re I see that it's uh, 7.50. Uh, what sort of time constraints did, uh, does everybody have? Should I stop here or should I continue? Uh, Dr. Reddy, usually um, CME goes until um, 8 o'clock. So would you like me to stop? You have about 10 more minutes, 7.50. Okay, maybe I'll go through one of the cases and, and, and I'll go quickly then. Okay, okay uh, let's not do the questions then. Let me actually go over how to think about statins. So this, 
One of the things we, we uh, struggle with is um, the use of statins in patients with uh, type 2 diabetes. And again, this um, uh, comes from the guidelines. So when we have patients coming to the clinic, um, we think about age-based consideration for, for when to start patients on statins. So those between 40 and 75, we use a risk calculator to try and figure out, should we start them on a statin or not? In patients who are at high risk, which includes patients with an LDL over 190 or diabetes, the question is not, do we start a statin or not? It's how intense should the statin be? So in this patient, we would start her on at least a moderate intense statin. The question is, should we put her on a high intensity statin? And this is where you look at things uh, or risk enhancers. And so in her case, family history of premature coronary artery disease, that is defined by if a male member of the family had, had uh, ASCVD less than 55, female less than 65, if she had an elevated LDL over 160, and I think I gave her an, uh, 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 actually her LDL was normal. If she has coronary, uh, CKD, metabolic syndrome, if she had preeclampsia, or if she had triglyceride over 175, and I think I gave her a 182, or if they have uh, any evidence of inflammatory changes, what this does is it puts this diabetic at a slightly higher risk. And so instead of using moderate intense statin, you might use a high intensity statin in that individual. So for example, instead of choosing 20 milligrams of a torvastatin, you might go with 40 or 80 milligrams of a torvastatin. So just to reiterate, any comer, even non-diabetic, if they're between 40 and 75, you use the AHA risk calculator. If you have a very low risk, you really would say lifestyle change. If you have a risk between five and seven and a half, you would use the risk enhancers. If they have other risks, you might consider a statin. If they're between seven and a half and 20, you'd probably favor the use of a statin. If they were over 20, you would use a statin and you'd probably try and get a significant LDL drop. In this individual who's a diabetic, you're going to start her on a statin, but you would use the risk enhancers to say, would you use a high intensity instead of a moderate intensity? So keeping this piece of paper somewhere to help you make decisions about guidelines can actually be really helpful and I would suggest uh, doing that. One of the other things we're starting to see is the use of cat, uh, coronary calcium scores. So you'll have people go and get uh, CAT scans and um, we'll come back with a score. The question is, what do you do about that? Here's, here's what the AHA says. If you have a coronary artery calcium score of zero, then it might change decisions. So say you did a risk calculation and you made a decision to start a statin, but the coronary calcium score comes back at zero. Then you might decide to hold off on statin use. If it wasn't zero, but it went from one to 99, you would still use a statin. If the coronary score was 100 or greater than 75th percentile, you would definitely use a statin and you might consider a higher intensity statin. That's how the CAC might affect your therapeutic decisions. Okay, all right, let's move on. Um, I'm actually gonna just move on from here. Now, this is a case that I wanted to present very quickly. A second case, 66 year old with type two diabetes, A1C is 7.3. But in this case, she has a blood pressure of 164 over 102. Um, she has acanthosis nigricans and decreased protective sensation. Again, I'm not going to do the question. Um, so here's the uh, guidelines on blood pressure. The classification of blood pressure, normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. Elevated blood pressure, as you can see, uh, Stage one, hypertension, 
is if your pressures are between 130 and 139 systolic, 80 to 89 diastolic. Now, what do you do if the pressures are over these guidelines? This is where you do a risk calculation again. If the patient has a 10-year risk of cardiovascular disease that's greater than 10%, that's when you would treat them with blood pressure lowering medications. If the risk is less than 10% and they fall into these blood pressure ranges, the guidance is you probably can do lifestyle change. If, however, they have stage two hypertension, defined as BP greater than 140 over 90, you would start them on blood pressure lowering therapy. Okay? And the, the, the final piece that I wanted to, to say is if patients have um, blood pressures over 160 over 100, which is what this patient had, a single medication might not be enough. You might have to start on two medications at once. And which two medicines should you start on? The three medicines that are typically started for type 2 diabetics are either ACE inhibitors or ARBs. The two together are not recommended because it increases the risk of hyperkalemia. Calcium channel blockers and thiazide diuretics. So you can use either an ACE inhibitor and a calcium channel blocker, an ACE inhibitor or a thiazide diuretic, and all of those in combination can give you improvement in cardiovascular outcomes, but not an ACE inhibitor and an ARB together. So I'm going to just reiterate this because I'm going so fast. The absolute Guidelines are to keep the blood pressure systolic less than 130, diastolic less than 80. If they are not there, if it's less than 140 over 90, you do a risk calculator. If the patient's 10-year risk is less than 10%, you might not have to treat with medicine. But if it's greater than 10%, you treat with medicine. If the pressures are over 140 over 90, everybody gets medicine. If it's over 160 over 100, you start off with two medicines because a single medicine might not be enough. Okay, that's eight o'clock. I think I'll stop. <laughs>